Good morning, um, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is the Care and Feeding of Your Creative Self panel, um, and we want to talk about how we've um, dealt with being creative people through some really, really hard times. Um, my name is Roberta Taylor, and I design um, mostly board games, um, both for hobby market as well as I have a real interest in um, meaningful play, sort of serious games, um, whether that's educational for a broader market. So that's that's um, a short about me. Um, yeah, um, and this, um, I'll introduce the first um, panels here. Um, Shoshana Kasek, I hope I said that right. <laughs> my apologies. Um, yeah, can you introduce yourself to us? Sure. So my name is Shoshana Kasak. I'm a primarily a LARP and tabletop designer. Um, I've been at this for uh, about 12 years now. Um, and I'm also a fiction writer. Uh, I've, you know, uh, I'm out in Brooklyn and I'm from New York and I uh, own a company called Phoenix Outlaw Production. So there you go. Thank you. Um, Kimberly. Uh, my name is Kim Lam. I'm a professional hobbyist. Uh, and um, I'm currently one of the curators for More Seats at the Table, which is a bi-weekly email newsletter that uh, focuses on highlighting creators with marginalized genders. Um, and my most recent published work is in the Love and Resistance Anthology. Awesome, thanks. And Paul Saxberg. That's me. I'm the community manager at Roxy Games, uh, where I help with dev and playtesting. So I've worked on games like Steam Hug Rally and Santorini. Um, I've designed three games of myself, but only one of them is worth ever looking at. It's called The Deadlies. It's from Smirk and Dagger, uh, and uh, working on a couple of other things that are coming up, uh, and then a bunch of other weird projects that are hard to classify. Um, regarding me personally, I'm on the autism spectrum, and I'm an ace, and my main interest would be psychology, comedy, and writing. Thank you. Awesome. So, um... I want to start off by just um, talking a little bit about how um, our panelists have experienced these past sort of nine months or so with regards to um, your, your creative self. And, and so what have been the biggest challenges that you faced and, and that, in that area? Um, yeah, does anyone want to start us off with that? Uh, sure, I can, if, the, if you want. Um, so the last nine months have been a little wacky, actually, for me. Um, previous to this, I was a uh, narrative designer for uh, an experiential uh, art installation called Meow Wolf out in Santa Fe. Um, so I was taking my game design knowledge and bringing it to that job. And uh, I was also doing game design and LARP design. Um, and then because of COVID, uh, I was laid off with about 200 other people. Um, so, on t like, my creative enterprises shrank uh, in a rapid succession also because LARPs basically stopped running. Um, so uh, everything pretty much shrank. And then I had to move back across the country. And so, you know, to get back to, you know, New York. And it was just a, um, a, a great deal of change for me creatively and professionally in a short period of time. So I had to sort of balance that with trying to keep alive the the creative energy that you know I wanted to continue producing in this nine months period. So it's been quite a quite a quite a ride. Yeah, it, it sounds like that um, you have that things that a lot of us were dealing with, and then a whole bunch of added extra joy of moving and everything, yeah. um, which which is is a handful. Um, Creatively, I think, what was the biggest difficulty in all of those practical considerations that that, that uh, upset caused, did you find? Um, I, I think the, the biggest problem is because I'd always set time aside, like, per day to do my own creative projects. And, you know, I, I never wanted to fall behind creating games and creating LARPs, uh, no matter what I was doing. Uh, but when COVID happened, you know, uh, with the isolation first, uh, it started to eat away at my creative time and just because of the stress of isolation. And then with everything that happened with, you know, losing the safety structure of having a, a day job and that sort of thing became more and more stressful and it just turned the screw more and more and more. So um, it was it was very difficult to find the energy, at, you know, during the day, even though I had the time uh, to to focus on my own creative things. Like it, it just 
you know, the everyday worries just drove it out of my head completely. So it was, it was a huge challenge to focus, I think, the most. For sure. Um, go ahead, Paul. I very much understand where you're coming from. Um, <clears throat> the situation is not the same, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm lucky and privileged in that I was able to keep my job because I can do it 98% um, of it from home. So yeah. that part was fine. However, it transitioned me out of an office setting, meaning I was now in charge of managing my own time and my own ADHD, um, which took a, takes a lot more spoons than I was expecting it to. And then on top of that, I've had a lot of issues because I have two family members very heavily affected by cancer right now. So I've had to make some trips and I've had to do a lot of caring for my family. And um, so in some ways, like if in some ways, it's actually like this could be a fantastic time for me. I could have all this time. I could be self editing my games and publishing them. And I've had got some of it done. But it's 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 like you say, just the the. Um, the mind space it throws you into. Uh, I haven't had the energy for a lot of time, a lot of this time, um, because that energy has been going to other things. So instead of spending four hours on a Friday night working on a game, I'll spend it binge watching some show. Right. Mm -hmm. I know um, that. Go ahead, Kim. No, no, no. Please go. I was, I was just going to say, but that's that that I have this time, but I don't have the emotional energy to do the thing. I think has definitely been a thread for myself as well. And and then that and then you add on the layer of, and now I feel guilty because I didn't do the thing I wanted to do. Yeah. And and that's been yeah. an ongoing struggle. Um. So I work in forensics. Um. So secondary trauma is sort of like a, a um, known hazard of my job. Um. So. For me, creative work has always been something that I do to de-stress from my job, and it's very compartmentalized, right? Like I've got my job, and I do all this work with people who have done horrible things with each other and that, or to each other and that sort of stuff. And then I come home, and it's this this separate thing. Um, and the world we're living in right now is ripe for secondary trauma or direct trauma, right? So now there isn't that um, compartmentalization that's happening, and so. My brain is like, ah, yes, you, you do creative work when you're not dealing with the potential for secondary trauma. So, too bad. And I was like, oh, here we are now, I guess. So, yeah, I'm, like, I do have to acknowledge that I'm very fortunate that I've kept my job. Um, they've been very good about like, safety precautions and that sort of thing. Um, I, I have a lot of things going for me. But we're still living in a world that um, can cause a lot of secondary trauma for people, so. Yeah, that uh, would be a large challenge. My, um, I, at the very beginning when everything was shut down and, and everyone's like, oh, I'm bored, I'm doing all these things, and like, uh, my work was in the middle of a huge transition that actually just meant that I had more to do than normal and was, there's only two of us at the store and it was, we weren't open for business, but we were going in every day and working. Um, and, and it was all learning curve. It was all new things to process. And so I was sort of a momentary looking around and being like, Oh, it'd be kind of nice to have nothing to do. And then I'm like, well, no, that's not better. Cause people aren't just sitting there actually. It's, it's not like the same as a vacation in any way. Um, but that just and then you know your head goes around and around like why why am i not being able to do the creative things or whatever and and i think there was this moment when i i was working on a contract that i and, and when i do game contracts it's usually i just love them like they're always a challenge and they're always really enjoyable and i was just resenting it and i was like what gives like this is my thing i do out of joy and 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 there's the joy's been sucked out of it and then i was like you know angry and you know i felt all those things and um you know I, I i that was kind of what i was thinking of when i was talking about this the, thinking about the idea of this panel is i'm pretty sure that that's not i'm not the only person who's dealing with things like this and that, and that sounds like that's definitely true um of everyone here um what i wanted to to ask next is is that at, in those places what what sort of things did you find yourself retreating back to when when your creative self was just like not showing up or scared or worn or whatever? Like, what did you do to cope with that loss? I think I've got the wrong set of questions, but that's still a good one. 
<laughs> um, who wants to go? Um, I'm curious to hear uh, Kim elaborate on that concept of secondary trauma, if you have any yeah. oh, thoughts sure. on, that, on um, how to, how to reestablish that compartmentalization. So, yeah, so secondary trauma is um, basically when you don't experience the trauma directly, but you are affected by it um, because you, you hear about it, um, you're involved peripherally around it, that sort of thing. So forensics is kind of obvious. Um, if you're a therapist, you can suffer from secondary trauma because you're hearing about it all the time. Um, if you're a first responder, that can happen because even though you weren't the one who was traumatized by an assault or a theft or whatever, uh, you're dealing with it and that sort of thing. Um, and like right now, people are dying all around us. They're sick, people are scared. Um, we're all isolated. We're all being affected by traumatic circumstances. So some of it might be direct, but some of them might be secondary, right? Like in my case, um, I'm fairly safe. Like if you look at, at sort of risk management and that sort of thing, right? Like um, I don't take public transit. Uh, I only work half time in the office right now. Um, we're all wearing masks, blah, blah, blah. Like in terms of a risk assessment, um, I'm relatively low in terms of my overall risks. So, um, but I'm exposed to the news. I'm, I, I'm constantly worried when one of my friends is like, haha, went in for a COVID test, you know, like it's, it's a scary time to be living and it's constant and it, there's that pressure. Um, so generally speaking, secondary trauma is has the same symptoms as normal trauma, normal, um, and can have the sort of same sort of effects and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, uh, in my case, um, uh, a friend of mine at work, actually a coworker, she um, was talking before this all happened about how her therapist would say to her, you know what, if, if your impulse if you have an impulse to do something and it isn't going to harm anyone and it isn't going to harm you, sometimes you should just follow it, right? Like sometimes you might not be able to intellectually articulate what it is you need, but your body and your mind will just give you this urge to do the thing. And if it's not going to hurt anyone, maybe you should just eat the whole bag of chips or binge watch whatever it is, your trashy TV show. Um, in my case, uh, <laughs> so, um, I deal primarily with RPG design and my, uh, my one joy is hacking mechanics. Like I love mechanics. I love messing around with them. I love seeing what they do at the table and how it affects how people engage with the fiction and all this other stuff. But that requires a lot of like deep digging into what something does and thinking and, and messing around with procedures and that sort of stuff. Um, so for the first couple of like months, um, I didn't really read anything. Uh, I, however, did do a lot of stuff that requires me to follow instructions and nothing else. Um, I learned how to solve a Rubik's Cube in under a minute. Uh, I'm very bad at juggling now. Um, and I do a lot of origami like I did before, but um, I don't design my own origami patterns or anything. So it's just a matter of following the instructions that are given to me. Um, and I'm and very persnickety and precise. So it takes me like three times as long um, to get any origami done. Um, but because I'm uh, egotistical, I brought um, oh, wow. jewel aids. So uh, I made flowers for my wife because she's awesome. No. Um, and OK, this I actually technically made before the pandemic, but it's too cool. It's a Rubik's Cube. That works. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Right? It's full of magnets. I love this thing so much. It's actually really simple. It's just a bunch of cubes but and magnets, but, like, come on. That's pretty awesome. That's okay. I think that's awesome, yeah. Yeah, like, it's super cool. I, I think I've failed the compartment. Com I don't know why I can't say that word. Compartmentalization. Um, because I don't, I don't know that I really thought it through. Um, when I'm creatively stifled i tend to turn to watching there's a couple of really good uh, game design video series like the extra credit series or gdc um but they weren't doing it for me <clears throat> and i think you're right that um in some ways just just finding something to do that doesn't require your brain is a good way to self-care 
I mean, it, you, it requires a brain, but it's more of a sort of a, like you say, following instructions mode, more of a passive mode. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have... I don't know if I have much more to add to that question. Uh, I, I know what you're talking about, though. I, I uh, do needlepoint. Uh, I inherited it from my, my mother and my grandmother. It's sort of a family thing that we did. And so uh, I found myself literally, you know, picking up needlepoint every day, uh, you know, at home and just watching familiar TV shows. Not new stuff. Like, there were so many new things coming out. But for me, I didn't want something that I had to engage my brain with. So I would just rewatch, like, old Star Trek. Or, like, I think I rewatched The West Wing twice. Like, I just went through season after season of, of TV. Because it was still, I guess, creatively inspiring. Because I always like to pick up new ways of writing dialogue or new ways of doing things. But at the same time, I didn't have to. I just sat there with the needlepoint, like, repetitive motion for... I don't know, weeks. Like, I, I, I finished, like, four projects. It was amazing. But, like, at the same time, I knew that I couldn't... I, I kept trying to write. Because um, I had started a novel right before COVID, like, hit. And I was really excited about it. And I managed to get, like, 35,000 words into the novel. And then when, like, the creative drop happened... I, it happened just in one day for me. It was literally just, like, dead stop for, like... After about a, two weeks of being stuck in the house. I just everything dried up. And so, like, that novel's still sitting on my laptop. It's not, it hasn't gone anywhere, um, but we'll see what happens with it. But uh, I just had to do repetitive motion tasks, like, like you were saying, like physical things that I didn't need to engage my higher brain functions for. Um, and that especially doubled after I lost my job. Like, it was just, like, nothing, absolutely nothing. Yeah, that's really interesting seeing that pattern. I got asked to knit a shawl for my um, oldest kid's wedding and ended up knitting four lace shawls um, while listening to audiobooks. And again, not new ones. I'd re-listened to ones I liked. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that that's obviously that I, I wanted to feel productive and creative, but I knew I couldn't, you know, I was just doing the what was required for any contract work was kind of like this painful okay, I have to motivate myself to do this because I have a deadline or whatever. And otherwise it was that falling back. And it's really interesting hearing how, how much of a pattern that, that was with, with everyone. Um, yeah. I guess then the next question is, is that if you had creative work that you did have to do, which um, I think to more or less extent, all of us had some degree of, you know, how how did that impact go, and and did you find any any great ways of coping with that, or did it just stay hard? Uh, I do have an answer for that, if if because uh, um, while I haven't had like I haven't had a lot of mandatory game design work uh, in a creative field, um, I do have to do a lot of public writing for Roxley. I do all of our Kickstarter updates. And I do, um, if you follow us, follow us on social media, you'll see all these amazing pictures from a guy named George. George, it is. He runs a company called Oniro. And they do, um, he puts up an excellent picture of a game. And then I'm responsible for finding a funny caption for it because I spent a whole bunch of years doing improv and I'm generally a goofball and I live on Facebook. So um, I'll get this this thing, this, this, you know, 50 odd pictures, and I'll have to come up with something hopefully entertaining to say about each one of them. And this takes way more time and effort than you would think it should. Like, this is something that should take 20 minutes when the, the, my brain uh, looks at it. But it can take an entire afternoon, and it can feel like pulling teeth. And um, I realized after a while, after doing this a few times, uh, what's missing is other people. Uh, improv comedy is way easier when you're part of a team. You can do it, like, some really good people can do it alone. Uh, I'm not one of those people. Um, and so one of the, the magic bullets to help solve it was invoking uh, other people. So Adam and Oren from Roxley and the Dice Throne guys, um, they've been super amazing. So I'll, I'll go through the list and, and do what I can, and then I'll be like, okay, I really want this, this, and this solved, Then I'll just throw it to the wolves and say... What do you got? And then you get that that interplay back and forth because I say something that inspires you to say something, inspires her to say something, and in the end, you end up somewhere that none of us would ever come up with in the first place, which I think is 
one of the biggest things I'm missing in this pandemic is that that day to day, we're just randomly chatting about whatever while we're doing our design work and, and playtesting games together and um, moving that online. Um, it's not impossible because there's tabletop simulator, there's Discord. Um, I'm finding it more challenging, but in terms of my own personal create, creative work, uh, that has been the biggest uh, magic bullet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'd say um, I agree with that. I like at, at, when I was working at Meow Wolf, uh, we had writers' rooms. Like I was part of a team of narrative designers. Uh, we had writers' rooms that we would break into for all of our meetings, and like being able to bounce things off of people was incredibly important and incredibly necessary for me. When it comes to game design stuff, I I, I have been like tabletop work. I freelance a lot, so a lot of that is you know just working on your own, you know, you get the outlet and the outline and then you just do what you got to do. So I've been used to working alone and sort of, you know, handing in stuff and then getting feedback. But um, I found that like I had gotten used to working in a writer's room and all of a sudden I was having problems because I was back on my own, you know, sitting, sitting behind a computer and I would be poking people randomly like online being like, can you take a look at this and see what you think? Like I needed, I needed some sort of, uh, stimulus and uh, you know the fact that like I was you know alone in the house on top of everything else was just frustrating beyond all belief so it slowed down everything but you know you do what you have to do that's the big thing if you have to do it you know you you, you push your way through but I definitely found myself dragging and it took a lot longer to do everything uh, mm-hmm. than I would have liked yeah yeah for sure I found that um I inability to just pull together a play test when I needed it was really, really the big, a big challenge, like logistically, because I mean, frankly, you can do a lot of stuff doing solo with like um, board games, especially like you can, you know, play all the pieces in it. Oh yeah, this works, whatever, but you're missing emotional reaction. You're missing response and you're missing seeing people's interaction with the space. And, and so I, I was just, Thing. like this project had so much potential and I felt it had just like drained out because the ability to do the work well and in the way that that I know like my poor household they're so good about sitting down when I ask them to do a play test or something but like it, it's it's this really limited tiny window um and so the the um group I was working for they actually mailed a bunch of prototypes out and for the most part the feedback was painful because this is like my eight-year-old didn't understand the game. I'm like, well, it wasn't designed for eight-year-olds. It was designed for college students. So let's, you know, there was a whole bunch of things that are so out of my control. And then we got one thing of feedback from um, a, a couple who also play a lot of games and worked in the educational sphere that, that the project was about. And I got like two pages of thoughtful feedback. And I just about, I could have cried. It was like, I've been needing this so badly, but you you just luck out. Like I have no way to create it. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that, you know, if this was the only way to work while well, learning to work tabletop simulator and learning to figure out how to get that feedback, but so much of the cues that I would watch for around a table, I don't know how to get those from, from an online connection either. Like I don't, I, I'm, I'm not getting the same body language and I'm not getting all those other pieces that, um, really, th- those are big, especially when you're looking at emotional impact of a game. So, um, f- for me, then that that took, like I said, it's it took the joy out of it, and it just became this. Okay, how do I get from A to B without ruining anything? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, now I think I would I would love to to. Um, begin a project that I I knew that I had these constraints and I could find something that fit in them better that just to have a, a, a positive experience at it again I think that would be sort of what I would be looking to ideally next but who knows <laughs> yeah and in my case it we've been putting this newsletter out for almost like two years has it been two I don't even know anymore um and like, so we have a procedure in place and I mean, our job is to curate. So it's to look for games and stuff and people were still producing. And a lot of people, because they were losing their day jobs because they weren't sure about the future, they were hustling hard. Um, and you could see the burnout on the horizon and I just sort of crossed my fingers and hoped and prayed for everyone. Um, 
but like I I found I couldn't read anymore. Like I would read something and it had no meaning. I would read it again and it would have no meaning. And I would read it again and be like, under other circumstances, this would I would be super excited about this game. And ah, uh, okay. Um, and again, I'm fortunate in that we often just take the text that um, the creators have already written because they are their their own best like hype machines. They know what they're talking about. Um, and yeah, it was it was hard trying to just get the energy to be able to process what I was reading, put it all together. Um, our deadlines got a little fuzzy sometimes, and we just shrugged and went, you know what? The world's on fire. A couple of days is not going to kill anyone. Um, and we're just going to go with it. Um, it's gotten easier. Uh, I can read now again, so that's nice. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been a time. So that, that brings me really well to, to the next sort of thing I want to talk about was you said, you know, that you can, you can read now. Did you, did you find that there was a moment where that shift happened or was it just sort of a, a buildup of, of getting used to things or, yeah. I think, okay, so the reading thing, I actually have a moment. Um, my wife got me a subscription I like found a sale coupon or whatever uh, to Marvel Unlimited, which it lets you read all of like the Marvel comics online uh, digitally, which is really cool. I discovered that because all the dialogue and all the things are in like little blocks everywhere and there's bright colors and stuff, I could read those and process them. And I don't, I do read comics. Um, there's a, a friend of mine who will curate his comic book collection and hand me the ones he thinks I will like. And his, his he's usually very good at picking the ones I will enjoy. Um, but that moment of finding something I could read was like so hopeful and joyful. I spent like three days straight just blasting through comics that I'd read before and the new like uh, Jason Aaron Thor um, series, which is fantastic, let me just say. Uh, and yeah, being able to consume something new in a way that I had not been able to like engage with anything for months on end was like this this ray of hope that started to open everything up for me again, which was fantastic. That's awesome. Um, yeah, did anyone else have a, a moment where you, you found something got easier or where you felt you could sort of have time to like take a breath and yeah. I think uh, for me it was when I started, when I sort of decided to make a plan uh, for things, like everything had gotten so amorphous for me. You know, I was at home, you know, there was no schedule. I was just kind of sitting around. And then when I realized, you know, I was going to have to move back across the country, I was like, all right, everything has to stop being amorphous now. I have to start making plans. I have to start doing things and I have to set up my day. Um, and I started doing that. And, and when, when I started doing that, I started to feel like, okay, I'm also going to give myself this time to read. I had the same problem with reading. I was just not being able to focus. And I had like a stack of books, like on my bedside table that was just getting bigger. And I just wanted to read all of it. Um, and then finally, I just started to set aside time. I started with audiobooks, you know, just because I didn't have to like focus on words. And then I just was like, okay, now I'm going to pop back over to forcing my way through like this first book and the minute that that happened all of a sudden it was like okay from like 11 to 12 o'clock i'm reading it doesn't matter like whatever is going on and if it doesn't work it doesn't work i'll go do something else but i'm gonna try so it was about making new spaces for doing things and once that sort of happened uh i, I started to reclaim all the stuff that like the stress was taking away um so i i didn't you know sit and watch tv for seven hours i would watch three and then i would go and do something else like so once that happened um i guess reestablishing my boundaries um that you know and that was only like i don't know june <laughs> so i'd already wait like spent a lot of that time uh you know taking it easy so i was like all right now i'm back on you know a clock except it's mine this time mm-hmm yeah, I, th I think I echo that as well. It's it's being able to get into that mental headspace where you feel like, 
okay, I'm good enough now that I can sit down and make a plan. You know, it, it's getting to that position in the first place, but however amount of rest or self-care. For me, um, I've recently been talking to a therapist about all the, all the ADD solutions, so going out and get some exercise, having a shower. Um, one of the biggest ones for me is I have three or four close friends that um, that also share my interest in art and psychology. And so I can get online and have a chat and be like, man, I'm just having a crappy day. How are you doing? Right. And, and so we'll talk back and forth. Um, and it's amazing the number of times I'm speaking to one of these people and she will just accidentally say the thing I really needed to hear at that moment yeah. um, or vice versa, you know? Um, and I think the best days I've had have been days like that after checking in with somebody like that and just, you know, Oh, what shows you've been watching? Oh, you know, the dog did this, you know, and then, and then you just sort of transition into, Oh yeah, this is really what's going on. This is really what's happening in the back of my brain right now. And then it lets you verbalize it and work through it. And then you're like, okay, I'm awake. I felt like I was walking through fog for the last week, but now, now I can actually, okay, I can push all this aside and go, okay, this is the important thing. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to make my prototype. I'm going to play it against myself a few times and, you know, blah. Um, yeah, for me, that, that check-in has, has been behind, I think, the biggest successes for me. Uh, that's interesting because I think that when we, we look at it, that, that that's been one of the big things that the pandemic especially did was it interrupted our normal human connections and... Um, I, you know, in, until you sort of sit down and, and it's, it's so obvious, but it, it doesn't occur, right? All this creative work, we do it alone, but it's for connection with people. Like it is all ultimately about that human connection. And when you just throw this enormous monkey wrench into it and you add in all this fear and stress and turmoil about all the other things that are going on, um, you know, it, it, it is going to interrupt and it makes sense that connecting with those people would be such a strong um, help. I know I lost all my, my patterns and my habits and, and whatever just kind of felt like it was, it, you know, really difficult. And, and for me, the moment when I felt like, okay, I can, I can build back space for this. I am, um, was when I started my, and, and I know better, right? Like how often do you do this to yourself? It's like, I had stopped journaling and I need to always do this. Like it's, it's such an important practice for me. And so I'm like, okay, this has to happen. And, um, and started making sure that I did that again. Um, and, and it's, it, the advantage of that for me was that at, the, at least I could say, well, at least I wrote in my journal, like at least I did that creative thing and it helped really. I mean, firstly, it does get the ideas flowing and whatever, but more importantly, it helped take away some of that guilt that I think was um, uh, really hard. And, and one of my biggest struggles through all of this has been having grace for myself. And I'm pretty good at giving it to other people. Like, yeah, you're going through a lot. But when I look at myself, I'm like, well, why aren't you doing better, right? And so being able to have some forgiveness for, and grace, just even though, because it's I'm just human too, but, you know, I think that tendency is to hold the standard way higher, Um and uh and so that really helped a lot um yeah uh it still is hard though some days like you know, i have a lot going on at work and my goodness i do not want to tackle a project or write on when i'm tired and uh it it's been that like you said kim about if it's not hurting anyone, maybe just do it. I think there's been a little bit of, of that, especially like I've just given up on trying to make evenings productive. It's, it's, if I don't get up early in the morning and do it, I, it's not going to happen. And I just need to be okay with that. Right. So there, there's been a lot of that. Um, I can totally, I can totally understand the guilt thing. I mean, that's been, I, I think, a lot of creatives have that just in general, like, especially if you're dealing with building your own schedules and freelancing, I've, I've, I've felt this, is that like, I feel like I'm not being productive enough in my free time because I should be more disciplined. I should be doing more, you know, it's, it's always been sort of a, a cross I bear, but like, it's, um, it got worse. It got way worse in, uh, in, um, in the, you know, in, in the, in the time of COVID. Uh, and so it's been uh, difficult to take the time to just be gentle on myself 
and to say, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm capable of doing this, but I just need to be a little bit more forgiving for my feelings at my time. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting thing that brings to mind for me. Um, there's an old video from John Cleese where he talks about creativity, and um, it's quite a long video, a good video, whatever you think of John Cleese is a separate issue. Um, but one of the things he talks about specific is being in the open or the closed mind mode. Um, the closed mode is fantastic for following instructions, for doing a mindless thing, for you know getting something done, um, like doing the dishes or mowing the lawn, whatever, right? But, but the open mode is what you need to be creative. And when you're under a deadline, when you're under pressure, when you're beating yourself up because you feel guilty, um, you're in the closed mode, which is gonna gonna put a put a serious stab in whatever creativity you're trying to generate. Uh, closed mode is great for getting things done. It's not great for inspiration or. Um, mm-hmm. So it can, I think it turns that into a sort of a, a self fulfilling spiral. The worse you feel, the worse it's going to be. Um, maybe you need to kick yourself sideways out of it somehow to get back into the open mode. Yeah. There's definitely, I think, been a lot of that. Okay, do I need to go for a walk? Do I need to go, you know, make a mess in the kitchen or whatever to try to get that change of perspective that can be really helpful, you know? Actually, if I can proceed a little further on that, um, one thing that has helped me, which might be a hack someone else can use, is... um, uh, it comes from the ADHD coping skills. When I have a, a job, which kind of requires the closed mode, like, oh, I've got 100 emails I need to answer this afternoon. Well, I know I'm capable of doing that. That doesn't mean I want to. <laughs> um, but what will sometimes make it easier for me is is to find a, a way to do the closed thing more creatively, like to improve the process, to find some way to change the process um, and that also has helped me when I've been sitting down and like trying to iterate a game um, is, okay, I know what I'm doing. I know I, I'm going to go iterate this game, but how, is there some new way I can do this? Like Kind of like what, um, what Kim was saying. Well, what's my impulse? What do I feel like doing differently about this playtest? Okay, so that actually gave me one of my best hacks for a self-playtest is to assign each player a personality and I, I pick people that I know really, really well. I say, okay, player A is Adam, and today he's feeling um, mischievous. And player B is Roberta, and today she's mad at me. And <laughs> you know, and then then I play the game. And when I'm looking at the game from that person's perspective, it's it's it gives a much better insight to me in terms of how they're going to play the game and how they're going to react and how they're going to feel about whatever's happening. Um, so that just came out of one of those random impulses, like like Kim was saying, and it helped create, it, it made going through the motions of, of doing this work that I was stressed about doing um, more entertaining and more inspiring. So I don't know if that helps anyone, but it helps me. Oh, that's, that's good. Um, I should pause and ask the fellows watching our channels and chats, are there any questions we should be looking at? There are no questions right now, though if anyone has any, uh, you can put that in the Twitch chat right now with question, colon, and then your question. That'll make sure it stands out to me nice and easy. Uh, Maybe we'll uh, go back to the panelists for a minute and let that populate, because we do have a little bit of a delay. For sure. Yeah, you know, that's very different, not seeing people's faces. And, and uh, the the first panel I did was actually re- pre-recorded, which was, of course, even less. Um, the, you know, I, there may have been questions when it was aired, but I was busy at work that day, so didn't see them. Um, so we actually have done a really good job of, of con- re- sort of restraining our conversation, and we're, we're not struggling with time at all, which is wonderful. Um, I, I want to know if any of the um, panelists here have things they wanted to, to revisit or that had brought things up as we we're continuing the conversation that um, um, might be helpful. And otherwise, I have a, a bonus question we can deal with at the end here. Do 
Steel Mills. Question. Oh, okay. sorry. Okay. Sure, yeah. <laughs> no, I. Uh, the, the only other thing that was in my brain was uh, one other thing I, I've been missing is just sort of um, because I can't go to game nights, I'm missing that that regular input of, oh, I learned this new game and it inspired something, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the only thought I have on that is to play more games against yourself, like regular ones, not just playtesting ones. Um, I did that as an experiment. Um, I got a hold of a used copy of Space Base, which I really liked, and I played it against myself just because I wanted to put a fresh experience in my brain because I was trying to create a game similar in feel. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to play it. And since I can't have no one else to play it against, I'm going to play it against myself. And, um, yeah, so that's the only other addition I would have. That's awesome. I took the time to go back and to go through some greatest hits of, in the past because, like I said, LARPing sort of, you know, had to go by the wayside, you know, because of in in-person games were not really a thing. Um, and so instead I went back and I looked at games that I've run in the past that were successful, things that weren't successful. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, you're so busy going to the next project, you know, you don't really maybe necessarily have the time to reflect as much on what you've done before as you might like. Um, and so I took that opportunity to go back and be like, okay, so this LARP, you know, we did for 80 people uh, went really well. We had plus minus five people who were happy. What were they happy about? What were they not happy about? And started making notes about that and being like, okay, how can I, how can I flip the script and take the stuff that I've learned and, and maybe bring that forward into my, you know, into my, my process going forward. And that wasn't not just, you know, the elements of the game itself, but also how to run games, how to, how to be a producer of games, like all this stuff I was able to take a little bit of time and really think about Think about my process, you know, and refine that. And I think it's been uh, a really interesting time of self-reflection for me as a as a designer. Um, uh, so that I feel like, you know, going forward, I've had that time to to say, okay, what do I want to be in you know in the future when we can start seeing one another? What do I want to do as a designer going forward? I'm not running from project to project right now. I can take a breath, and that's been really strange considering how claustrophobic and, and wacky and you know dumpster on fire everything's been but i've you know managed somewhere to take a breath um i think it started somewhere over the summer and just think about things for a while so that's been very helpful mm -hmm. yeah um i was just thinking uh be okay with not finishing things celebrate not finishing things like yeah. as a hobbyist this is really easy for me to say because i don't actually have to pr create a product that I have to publish. So I understand that this is a, a very privileged position. Um, but there is something to be said about doing a thing and then being like, well, it's not finished, but I'm done with it. And that's okay. Um, I was playing around a little bit with uh, the Quest RPG splats and whatever they're called. Um, you can tell I'm really into it because I don't know what they're called. Uh, but like, so I was writing like a werewolf thing and like one of the abilities that I gave the werewolf at the highest level was like, you glow and you count as the full moon for other werewolves. And I wrote that and I'm like, I'm done. This is beautiful. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting myself a cookie. This is great. <laughs> and it was kind of nice being like, well, I don't actually need to reflect that I got to the point that I was happy with it and it was just for me and good enough. I can jump in here with a, a comment and a question. Uh, one comment that got a lot of positive responses from other people in the chat, and I know I felt it too, was that it's just really validating hearing other creatives talking about creative exhaustion. That's from Basic and Bizarre. And I think also we talked about briefly the idea of um, not having a social connection and just being able to vent things. And listening to you all talk has been really validating for me and apparently also a few people in the chat. Yay. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Now, actually, mm -hmm. two questions for you. One from uh, Nelly Amney, or N-E-L-I-A-M-N-E. -E. Question, do you have any tricks or tips for when your tank is on empty and you know you need to care for yourself, but it's hard? That's um, a good one. Kim, go ahead. So anything worth doing for yourself is worth doing half-assed, is something I learned online. So it's like, you need to eat. You can't 
you don't even have the energy to make a meal, go stand in front of the fridge, reach for the thing you can eat cold and stuff it in your face. Like just stand in front of the fridge and do it. Reach into the cupboards. You have crackers. Can you eat it now? Do it now. Uh, if you can't shower and you can't be bothered, take a cloth, wet it and rub it against your face. You know what? Good enough. Because even a little bit, even half-assing it is better than nothing. That's, that's very good. I love that, yeah. I think uh, Kim's uh, comment earlier about how your instinct will tell you what you need is, is really good. Um, have a nap, have a shower, go out and walk. If you can't do an exercise, just go to the mailbox, you know. Um, Self-care takes different things for different people, and for me, it, it varies by the day. Um, check in with a friend if, you know, if you're in the mood for it. If you're not, turtle up, watch a show, you know. Um, it's, it doesn't sound very scientific because it isn't very scientific. The brain is a big, complex, mushy thing. We don't have, you know, um, amazing. I, I would say um, maybe try and know your triggers and know your, your things that spiral you downwards. Maybe don't doom scroll on Facebook all day. Um, you know, I spent a lot more time watching election results than I should have in the last week. Um, but, um, you know, like, <laughs> I think I could stop talking at that point there. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's, uh, it's two things. One, uh, try to look at, if you can, if you have, if you have the spoons to be self-reflective at the time, uh, just try to like, look at yourself and be like, what do I really need? Like I'm reaching for a cookie. Is that what I really need right now? Because if you then eat the cookie and it's still not helping, you haven't really answered the core problem. Uh, you know what I mean? So like, it, but that's only if you have the energy to like be self-reflective in the moment, otherwise eat the cookie, just, you know, take care of yourself. But, um, it might help in the long run to sort of look at like, when I'm reaching for that cookie, am I needing the cookie or am I needing something in my mouth because I'm bored? Like that's, you know, that's a, a good way to look at it. But for me, it's also, I need accountability buddies, like, like nobody's business because I forget to eat. I forget to take my medicine. I'm, I'm one of those people who like five hours afterwards, I'll look up from a television set and be like, Oh, I feel terrible. Why is that? Oh, I haven't done anything for five hours that I should. Um, so I, I, I have people that I reach out to, where I'm like, could you just remind me to get up and eat, I'm like to take my medicine every once in a while, and I'll just have a friend who pokes me. Um, it's it's difficult sometimes to reach out for help that way, but if you find a buddy that can like look in on you and you can look in on them, especially it, it will feed that social need that you that we're all really lacking right now. Um, I think, and so it, it feeds on two levels, right? It helps you keep even, and it also gives you somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. I think that's fantastic. I think psychology often boils down to grossly oversimplified. You're avoiding something, or you're moving towards something. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in a doom mode, it's often because I want to avoid something, and I can't. Mm -hmm. And so checking in with a friend, like Shoshana just said, um, she might say to me, oh, what are you avoiding right now? Because I don't know, but that stops it makes me go, oh, ding, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So you said there were two questions. Yes, I have another from Clark Valentine. We kind of touched on this a little bit, but I think we can still explore maybe a little bit more this feeling of... Um, uh, how do you tell the difference between self-indulgent procrastination and necessary self-care? How restorative is it? And like, how can you tell the difference between something that is restorative or not with a kind of zooming in addendum of like healthy slash unhealthy self-care? What's the difference? What are the indicators? I, I, my, my first thought on that has to do with Paul's comment about avoidance. Um, I think sometimes we tell ourselves that we're taking care of ourselves when it's actually that avoiding something that, that we know is maybe hard a little bit, but would actually be beneficial. Um, sometimes that's, that's dealing with a problem that just sucks to deal with. Sometimes it is, I really will feel better if I go for a walk and, and whatever. Um, that so that's one thing that comes to mind immediately um does anyone else have thoughts on that i i really empathize with that question <laughs> um, um, so, um i think oh go on 
Yeah, okay, I was just going to say, I, I don't know where the, the line is, but it's somewhere, I know it's somewhere between half an hour playing Civilization and six hours playing Civilization. <laughs> and this, I don't know what the solution is, but it may involve checking in with yourself or checking in with other people. Yeah, I think for, for me, it's uh, when I, generally I try to, to if, if my body says, uh, you need a break, I take the break. But if I check in, I try to check in with myself after a little while and be like, does this feel good? Like, that's, that's really where it comes down. Like, if I'm, I take naps when I get stressed out, like, my body just needs to check out, like, immediately of the stressful, you know, anxiety. Otherwise, I go spinning off into, you know, anxiety attacks. Um, but, like, so this week, for example, during the election, I was just taking naps left and right. And then after a while, I was like, hang on a second. Am I doing this because I'm just avoiding stress and I really should be like engaging with the world and trying to do this in a different way? Um, and that was when I realized that I woke up from a nap and I felt worse than when I went to sleep. Like that was, that's what did it for me. And I was like, okay, so we need to watch this. This is now being self indulgent and it's actually making the situation worse. Um, so I get just set an alarm to check in with yourself, maybe. Like I, I, I have alarms every hour on my phone so that I can take stock as to where I'm at. And it'll be like, take a drink of water and now think about what you're doing. Does this still feel good? Are you feeling accomplished? If you're not, maybe consider that this is not where you should be right now. Um, so another thing that you can also do is check in with yourself when you're feeling good, because then you'll get a better sense of when, when you are feeling good and things are kind of okay. And you'll kind of just have, be able to calibrate that way as well. Right. Because it's like, oh, I had my meals on time and like this is what I felt like before. And I realized I was I should eat lunch or whatever. And then afterwards this is how I felt and it feels pretty good. And OK, now I know what that feels like. And then the next day after you've eaten an entire like bag of Cheetos and those sort of things like, well, I ate and now I feel like shit and I want to eat some more. Maybe not. Maybe that's not the right answer. Because <laughs> um, like. We talk a lot about checking in with yourself but when we're feeling like crap, and that's important, absolutely. Um, but it doesn't hurt to check in with yourself when you're feeling pretty good because then you get a sense of that. And then you can also have that sense of, oh, it's actually not that bad of a day. Okay. Right? And that's, that's kind of nice, that little happy slice of life. You know, things aren't joyful, but they're, they're okay. It's, it's also really good to just hold in your mind what the, the sort of direction you want to be going is. Like, oh, this is what's good. This is what I want to try and get closer to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I think um, Roberta's comment about journaling is, is one of the best possible ways to check in with yourself. Um, I usually don't find I have the patience to do it, and so I will literally just have mm -hmm. a conversation with myself while I'm doing chores or something. I will actually talk to myself. Uh, being on the spectrum, I don't give a crap what people look. I don't give a crap what people think of me. So I will have a conversation with myself while I'm walking down the street, and people go, what is that lunatic doing? They're like, oh, I'm wearing headphones. I'm talking to somebody. You know? <laughs> talking to me. Yeah. No, I appreciate the comment about checking in and you're feeling good, because it is, it is so important to also take the time to to enjoy those moments and not just, like, rush on to the next crisis, because I think sometimes... It, you know, you, you, you don't hold them as well either. And uh, so I really appreciate that. Uh, that was, that was really good. <laughs> I just add one more. I, I tend to check in at when I wake up and when I go to sleep, I do a, a like a day in review when I go to bed and, and it's to do that check in also like to say, what was great today? How can we reproduce that uh, tomorrow? And like, or what was terrible? Let's avoid that. Uh, and then I do the same thing in the morning to sort of take an intake of what my spoons are for the day to like wake up because I've, I've got chronic health issues so like i've got to be like all right let's marshal what we've got for today what do we want to recreate from yesterday and then also to just like look back and say okay yesterday was good let's do better let's let's keep going you know what i mean to set in sort of a, a of a self-care agenda you know and just review how it works right before i go to bed i really like that thank you for that mm -hmm. For sure. So we're coming towards the little bit at end of our time. Um, 
were there any more questions that came up in the chat before I, I go on to my last little bit here? Questions left in the chat, just a whole bunch of agreement, including Basic and Bizarre, saying that they have an alarm for everything. Awesome, that's great. Um, yeah, so just, I, th I had a little sort of, um, and I, we've covered so much ground here, and I definitely myself feel really encouraged and motivated. I'm hearing a lot about really being deliberate in how, how we treat ourselves and our creativity, and I think um, that's, that's definitely a good, great reminder of, 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 of that. Um, it's important to me, maybe I should be doing those, those things a little more deliberately. Um, but in the last, in the last while, has there been a standout thing, whether it was a moment or an experience or whatever that just really encouraged you or caused you to think or caused your creative soul to kind of spark up and go, Hey, I'm here and I, I, I'm excited. Um, yeah. Um, I watched the the Haunting Houses series on Netflix, so The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly Manor. Um, and I usually don't watch horror, but they are fantastic. Like the storytelling is great, the cinematography is great. Um, I obviously have opinions about each one. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't watch tons of new media, and so to suddenly be consuming so much of it, I'm, I'm thinking about haunted house RPGs, I'm thinking, and also it helps that I did those overviews of the, the Love and Resistance anthologies, because now I'm thinking about hacking those, or like how those could like fit in and that sort of thing, and just, just feeling inspired to think about it again is really encouraging, so... Yeah, there's something about that moment when your when your creative mind starts running in the background and I'm like, oh hey, I've missed you kind of a thing. Right? It's just really awesome. Yeah. I uh I haven't had many of those, but they're good and, and they're good to hold on to. I don't know if I can point to a specific um best moment, highlight moment, but uh I, I definitely resonate with what you're saying there and in, in um I know Roberta, you're very big on the concept of the polymath. Um, that when when you uh, learn something new, some new skill, some new field that you previously didn't know, and all of a sudden it like starts combining with the fields you do know, and or and I think the same thing can happen with different genres of media or games or that sort of thing. So I I, I have had that happen to me as well. Um, like I say, starting to I mentioned before the panel, I'm going to start looking at possibly designing a role playing game, which I've never done before. Um, which is a really fascinating new world to start exploring and, and meeting experts like like people in this panel. Um, I, know, I know that's not all your specialties, but some of you it is. Um, and and just how that starts to start colliding with the things that I do know about can be super inspirational. Um, so in a way, I, maybe this panel is actually the the, the trigger, the, the inspiring trigger for me. Aww. Um, for me, it was, uh, I started driving by myself. Um, I, I only got my license to drive last year. And so uh, I was terrified to drive in New York. And uh, I finally got the opportunity to drive to New Jersey and then drive back at night by myself. And it's, it was the moment of just feeling free, like breaking that routine of being stuck in the house and like, you know, just sitting in the car, jamming on some music. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, my brain's starting to like creatively wake up that this feeling of freedom a little bit, you know, and I, I sketched out the beginnings of a new novel, which I'm working on for NaNoWriMo this month. And, um, you know, so, and I'm feeling that creativity and I made a plan for the role-playing game that I'm working on and all this different stuff. And like in the car, as I'm driving back, you know, I, I just started to feel that wake up again because I had stepped outside of my comfort zone. Um, so do, you know, doing something small, even that steps out of your comfort zone, like driving somewhere or just, you know, can can help, especially in the age of like being locked in as much as we have been. Oh, that's beautiful and perfect. Thank you. That's like the best way we could possibly end this with just that. <laughs> that that's, a, that's such a perfect story. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're coming to the end of our time here. And I just want to thank everyone who came in to chat with us today and everyone who came in to listen and to join in on the on the conversation on the chat as well. Um, it's definitely, I think, been encouraging and 
um, refreshing to just connect with other folks and uh, not feel quite as isolated today. So yes, thank you very much.